Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Virtual Investor Spotlight Series. Today, we have the Virtual Investor Defense, Defense Production Act Spotlight. My name is Janine Thomas. I'm CEO of JTCIR, and I will be the moderator for today's event. I am pleased to be joined by Mark Jensen, Chairman and CEO of American Resources, and Mark Lavragada, VP of Corporate Finance and Communications of American Resources. Gentlemen, welcome back to the platform. Hey, Janine, thanks for having us on. Good seeing you, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so before we get started, we have great participation already on the line. So I wanted to remind our listeners that American Resources is publicly listed on NASDAQ and trades under the ticker AREC. During today's discussion, the company will be making forward-looking statements, and we encourage you to go to the company's website and SEC filings for the latest information on the company. So, Mark and Mark, uh, to start, I'd like for both of you to introduce yourselves. I know we have a lot of um, stakeholders on the line that know the story, but we have a lot that don't. So why don't we start off with introductions, and then we'll get into the story. So, Mark J., why don't you go first? Yeah. For all of you that don't know me, my name is Mark Jensen. I'm the chairman and CEO of American Resource Corporation, also one of the founders. And uh, as far as I know, the largest shareholder of the company. I'm Mark Lavragetta. Um, been with uh, American Resources essentially since its inception. Um, been a co-founder of all of our related businesses. Um, and previously have uh, capital market experiences, product development experience, um, um, and now just driving uh, the initiatives of American Resources and American Rare Earth, as well as some of our other businesses that are private. Awesome, so, so happy to have you with us. So Mark Jensen, if you could just give us a high level overview of American Resources. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so American Resources, we started in 2015, uh, me and my partners. Um, the primary focus of the business is to provide high value raw materials to both the infrastructure market as well as the electrification market. Our, our two primary divisions are American Resources Corporation, or American Carbon Corporation, uh, which is our mining division where we mine met carbon. So met carbon, which goes into the steel making process. Uh, built this through eight acquisitions, uh, most of them through bankruptcies where we bought them right and have obviously brought those into production in this very strong market right now. A uh, profitable entity. Uh, we talked about our revenues. We're ramping up revenues every month. Uh, had a good month last month and, and on track to have a good month this month. Um, then American Rare Earth is our innovative in division, which we started from the ground up almost six years ago. We started looking at the different ways of producing rare earth and critical elements domestically. Um, as we did that, we continued to pivot towards the highest value contributor to our shareholders. Um, and have continued to build that through even acquisitions is with the latest LOI we signed, which will finance out of cash flow, um, which was uh, ETI. Um, what that does is it gave us the first mile of producing rare earth critical elements from uh, raw materials, but also the primary division, uh, chromatography, the value contributor we're building our current facility, uh, be operating here in very shortly. Uh, we'll talk a little bit further about that is the ability to produce rare earth critical elements on an isolated purified basis on a commercial basis being the first one in the country to do that so it's a uh, we have the the business lines that are currently generating cash flow and revenue and ramping up continue to generate more cash flow and then also the division that'll be shortly here generating revenue providing a solution that is desperately needed in the domestic market Excellent. And I don't think the timing could be better for a discussion like this. I've been very much looking forward to getting you guys on and really diving in deep to this. I even wore my American sweater in, in um, anticipation of this event. So looking forward to get started, guys. Um, so American Resources has an ever-growing footprint in carbon, metals, and most recently, rare earth elements. Um, could you touch base on the American Rare Earth Business Division and the company and what is your vision there and um, what do you expect moving forward? So Mark L, why don't you take that one? Sure, happy to. Um, yeah, American Rare Earth uh, represents a, a, a very large strategic opportunity for us. Um, it's, it's no secret, um, we're in the very early onset of a transition in our energy sources uh, globally and, and, and here in the US. Um, traditionally, our energy sources were, have been very fossil fuel dependent. Um, as we are beginning to transition, uh, the applications in energy are very, very mineral intensive, very, very, very mineral um, dependent. 
the biggest differentiating factor between those two is that fossil fuels are burned and they're lost forever. Uh, the minerals that are in these applications, um, like a, an electric vehicle, clean wind energy and things like that, those high value minerals are recyclable, can be collected, can be purif purified and then reused in new applications. Um, so from a strategic standpoint, that's how we're approaching the market um, first and foremost. Um, and then as you look at the, um, you know, assumptions and demand growth worldwide, you could look at EVs on its own right, but across the board, whether it's technology, um, electric vehicles, clean energy, uh, the demand growth is, accept is expected to grow precipitously several hundred percent um, year, you know, over the next decade. Uh, so to tackle that demand um, from a supply standpoint and to create, you know, um, sustainable and, uh, and resilient supply chains, it has to be a ha all hands on deck approach. Um, recycling isn't going to be the only source of these purified raw materials, but it's going to be an important part of it, especially as um, us as the United States, the largest consumer economy in the world, consumes a lot of those materials and a lot of those applications. Um, I think for shareholders, the best thing to look at from our standpoint under American Rare Earth, we have two main tracks that we're focused on. Um, the one is the final stage of isolation and purification. Um, it is a problem that needs to be solved and it needs to be done with innovation. We have to get out from underneath the dependency of foreign nations like China to be able to compete on a global stage. Um, and for that, it provides us a great opportunity strategically uh, to execute and make the largest impact here in our domestic supply, supply chain. Um, our final stage of isolation and purification does that for us. Chromatography is a, is a game-changing application. It's been used for decades in pharmaceutical industry. It's proven. Um, we are applying it and we have the right team to put it in place to apply it to non-molecular or non-organic non molecules. Um, in particular, in, in taking a organic process uh, and, and, and applying it to a more metallurgical process. Um, and we have the team to do it. We have the partnerships to do it. Um, and, and if you look at how we've built out our partnerships, whether it's Purdue, Purdue University, where we acquired these patents from or where they, where they were developed, um, they bring laboratory expertise to us. Uh, we've partnered with CMID and um, experts in chromatography that came out of Eli Lilly. Uh, they, they, they led the uh, purification process uh, and chromatography process for, for Eli Lilly uh, for decades. Um, and then as we move down uh, the supply chain, we've partnered with the Heritage Group that brings um, uh, a great network, great application in material science um, uh, and to really solidify those upstream and downstream partners for us. Um, the, the other side that investors should think of is our own feedstocks. So besides have, bringing that solution to the domestic supply chain of isolation and purification and having the ability to recycle end of life products, we also have um, a focus on developing our own feedstocks, coal-based waste coal and, and coal byproducts. Um, we're one of the largest um, owners of mining infrastructure in East Appalachia. And our whole thesis around that is leveraging our asset base. How can we better leverage our asset base um, to, to better utilize our entire resource base and, and monetize those critical and rare earth elements that we can, that we can produce? Um, and we've created great, great partnerships there um, with Texas Tech University, uh, Dr. Jerry Boddy, who's, who sits on our board of directors, um, uh, the, the, the recent acquisition that Mark just, uh, just talked about ETI that they, they all play an important role in that. So from, um, you know, an outsider looking in or an investor or prospective investor, it's, you know, under the rare earth division, it's, it's, it's tackling that final stage of isolation and purification, solving the equation there and chromatography being such a flexible, um, uh, application. Um, and being able to recycle first and foremost. We think that's the largest impact we can make by taking, be, be, and we're a, a few weeks away of being the, the first producer of domestically sourced purified raw materials. Um, and not only are they domestically sourced, they're sustainable. They're all done from either uh, recycled, the, our first train, our first production line will be on recycled magnets and our second production line will be on recycled lithium ion batteries. That's a very powerful uh, message when we look at downstream partners to be able to provide them highly pure raw materials that they need, that need to go into new, the manufacturing of new products and applications being domestically sourced and sustainable. 
Excellent, Mark. You know, there's so much depth and breadth to the American resources story and all of the pillars of growth within, within that umbrella. Um, I want to focus our discussion today on the recent charge from President Biden to the Defense Department to consider the critical minerals required to make the batteries used in clean energy technology as an essential to national security under the Defense Production Act. Can you give us a quick take on your view of the De Defense Production Act and how you believe American resources is positioned? Yeah, I'll jump in on that. <clears throat> um, I mean, it's, it's essential, right? Like we we're down at Crane yesterday, one of the third largest military base or naval base in the country. And the need for batteries, lithium ion batteries for backup missile defense systems and, and everything. And then the growth of the electrification market. I mean, with President Biden pushing aggressively on the electrified economy, we don't produce any of that today. And at the end of the day, the, from a battery recycling perspective, we don't recycle batteries today in this country. We shred them and produce a mixed nickel cobalt alloy that doesn't go back into the battery markets. It's not battery grade. Um, when we focused our efforts on innovating and building out the technology that was built by Purdue, utilized by Eli Lilly for drug purification, we wanted to focus on where the life of the market was going and invest our resources and our capital and our time in developing the processes to be able to go right back into that market. Um, it's a, it's a huge deal. I mean, the, what our chromatography technology can do can isolate and purify the lithium, cobalt, nickel, manganese, but also the carbon black and graphite and separate it out. We use various techniques to get density separation done, which I actually learned from our mining industry. Um, and then utilizing chromatography and the patents that were developed at Purdue, which we have the exclusive worldwide rights to for any feedstocks on being able to isolate and purify those elements back to battery grade material to be able to supply them into the market. Um, if anybody believes it, doesn't believe that the growth of the electrified economy is becoming substantial, it's, you, you can pick up any news article and read about it. Um, what's key is, though, we're building this out to be actually commercial this year. Um, the first production trains will be operating absolutely in the first half of this year, as we said it would. Um, and then it's continuing to scale it from there. But our cost of CapEx of building this out isn't that substantial. Um, we, I mean, at the end of the day, how we build it was learning the lessons from Bill Smith, who did this for 35 years at Eli Lilly. And being able to supply into this, the need of the market in the U.S. space, I mean, not only for our own national security and working with the military applications and the government applications, but also the growth of the commercial market with our technology and cost structure, there's nobody else that can compete against us in our opinion. And uh, you know, pretty soon it's not just gonna be our opinion too. Yeah, I think one thing to add to that too is, you know, from, uh, from our final stage of purification chromatography, it is not a, you know, boxed up, buy off the shelf type of application, plug and play. Um, you have to have the right team, you have to have the right engineers to be able to uh, design it, uh, engineer it, tweak it for, uh, various feedstocks, um, and we have we have that in place. When you look at the defense, uh, the uh, Defense Production Act, um, not only are they a massive consumer of these type of applications and technologies and raw materials, but from a recycling standpoint, they're a great producer of feedstocks as well. Um, it makes and it just makes sense keeping those keeping those materials in within our borders. Um, to be able to refine, recycle and refine and put back in, whether it's DOD um, or, you know, private industry, it just is a practical, make, it's just practical, it makes the most sense uh, for us to compete on a, on, on a global stage. Excellent. So I know you've been building um, for the past 12 to 18 months, really having the opportunity to, sh to showcase the evolution of, of this space. Um, and you're leveraging some exciting proprietary and industry leading technologies in critical and rare earth metal processing and purification that can play a key role. Can you speak about those technologies and provide some insight uh, into the collaborations that you've established? Yeah, I mean, if you talk, look how we got in the space six years ago, we, we started looking at how to produce it from waste streams from the mining industry, because that's where the government was investing hundreds of millions of dollars. And we had control over 30,000 acres of land. Um, so it's, we, we own a lot of resource um, or have the rights to a lot of resource for that matter. We, we started off at looking at how do you get 
to that point of producing that and, and clean up the environment, but also produce valuable materials in that process. So we licensed technology from Ohio State or Ohio University. And the scientists that, brought it, that developed it was Dr. Body, who then shared the chemical engineering department at Texas Tech on electrolysis and uh, been a phenomenal partner, phenomenal board member for us um, of being able to concentrate low feedstock product. And that, what we saw though, is there was nobody else taking it to that next level. There's nobody that could isolate and purify it in the domestic market. Solvent-based extraction is never gonna be done here successfully. Um, it's, co it's very cost ineffective. It's very expensive to operate, but it's also environmentally harmful. Um, it's a thousand different mixers and settlers of very harsh chemicals. And so to be able to do that, we needed to innovate. We needed to look at new opportunities and new technologies. We looked at various forms of chromatography. Um, we looked at many different parties that had chromatography technologies that were relatively rudimentary. And when we found the technology at Purdue and, and more importantly, Dr. Wang, who had been working on this for over 40 years, um, she, I mean, 40, 40 years, um, she, she had the keys to it. Then more importantly, she had the relationship and or the, the enhancer of the relationship with Bill Smith to not only have the technology, but how to commercialize the technology cost effectively. And there's some secrets to that. Um, there's some secrets on how to make chromatography move faster um, to make it really economical. Rare earth elements and critical elements aren't rare. They're everywhere. Um, the rarity is how do you concentrate them cost effectively to get them to an economic basis? And I mean, including our last acquisition, which we'll talk about here, I'll more than happy to talk about further, is ETI, is being able to utilize nuclear density analyzers to separate out and utilize physical separation to produce higher value concentrate products. Um, but those, the partnerships that we've been able to establish is looking at where's the commercial aspect of it? How do you actually make money in this, in this space? And a lot of people are talking about it. And then there's probably 20 different companies out there that claim they have the ability to recycle batteries or recycle or produce rare earth elements. Very few of them are actually commercializing them and or bringing it to a commercial basis in a way that can be economically viable and very scalable. Um, and that's really what the differentiator is for us. I mean, the relationships with the end of life wind turbine uh, farms that we have, the, the end of life products that we're getting from the metal recyclers and then the OEMs that we're in conversations with. I mean, there's, that's where you get the real volume that enables this to happen. And then the need they want to go back into their own, their own supply chains to be able to produce it domestically. And that's being built today. And we're gonna keep going upstream and we're gonna keep going downstream to continue to build this out. Um, on a commercial basis, but to be the, the solution for that isolation purification, which is really the, the main key of our technology is that we are that bottleneck in, in the market today that nobody else can do. Yeah, I think one of the m other differentiating factors too is when you look at a lot of these applications and technologies um, and their competitive aspect in it globally is they have to be low cost. Um, you to, you, China will continue to undercut us if they want to, um, but to, we have to innovate to really be able to compete. Um, you know, China has low social and, and environmental standards that gives them a, and, and they're highly, highly subsidized by their, by their government. That gives them a huge advantage. Um, so to really compete with them, you have to look to be able to um, have an application and technology that is low cost. Um, and then secondly, you have to have an application that is environmentally safe. Um, that's where the innovation lies. That's where the competitiveness lies. Our, our first chromatography facility is in a, a very commercial industrial park with a kids gymnastics center three doors down from us. Um, it, it, we, we permitted it in three months. It's, uh, it speaks to the, the environmental safety of it as uh, it's all aqueous based, um, no wastewater discharge. Anything that's really discharged could be flushed down the drain. Um, it's done at ambient temperatures, so very little or zero um, hydrocarbon emissions. Um, so that that provides us the platform to truly compete and then to produce those. And like Mark said, um, using feedstocks, having the advantage of, of innovating feed, various feedstocks to be concentrated enough to make economic, economical sense and, and be economically viable in, in the commercial, not just a science experiment, actually be a real business. Um, and that's, what's, that's what the patents, some of these um, acquisitions that we've made allow us to do. Excellent, so I wanna expand on that. American Resources has made great strides in securing strategic and innovative partnerships within the rare and defense divisions. Why do you believe those technologies are important and a key piece to the market at this time? I mean, one, nobody, nobody else is doing it. Uh, I mean, chromatography 
is a solution that will produce a 99.5 to 99.99% purity in a very consistent basis, but also in battery grade materials and or magnet grade materials where, and there's a lot of technologies out there, hydrometallurgical or pyro to recycle a battery to produce black mass. And there's a lot of people doing that, which is awesome because that's, you give me the ideal feedstock, that a black mass from a battery recycler and the partners that, that are out there, that's a, that's a big deal for us. I mean, that makes it extremely economical. Um, and and that's, that technology enables us to go back into the, the domestic supply chain that everybody's talking about doing. I mean, our late, the latest acquisition of ETI is, that's a big deal because of the physical separation aspect of it, of being able to take a very low concentrate product, which is all throughout the world and all throughout the country, and being able to very, very cost effectively produce it to a high value concentrate or on a percentage, you go from parts per million to a percentage basis um, without, with very nominal cost. I mean, it, there's basically no manual labor in the process at all. And then going through electrolysis, we can take a two to 5% or even a 1% product and bring it to a 50% concentrate product. Then you go to chromatography and bring it to that 99.5 to 99.99% purity. We have the entire supply chain, we have the entire technology chain to be able to make all products viable domestically. And other products are gonna be more viable than others. I mean, magnets are absolutely by far the lowest cost feedstock. Lithium ion batteries, black mass is probably slightly even lower cost than our magnet process. But then you go to the ores or the carbon-based materials and all of a sudden with, with taking out the labor aspect of it, you're able to produce very high value products with low cost because of the technology, because of the innovation versus just doing it as people have done it for the last hundred years over in China where like Mark said, they, there's no labor laws, there's no environmental standards, so they can just continue to do that. When I went to China, there's people literally mowing highways with physical mowers. Like, I mean, not like not big industrial mowers, but like because they didn't, they were just trying to create jobs and they didn't care about costs when it's state owned enterprise funded. We can't do that here domestically. And that's what a lot of people are still looking at solvent based extraction. I haven't heard of one person looking at a solution other than some modified version of solvent based extraction. And even a lot of the scientists I've talked to about this self admittedly said it'll never make money but they get research, they get funding for it. And that's what their jobs are. And I appreciate that. We're not about that. We're about commercialization and, and generating returns for our shareholders doing it. Excellent. I've heard you refer to these technologies as game changer, not only for the environment, but also for establishing a domestic supply chain. Could you go further into what is needed to produce an independent circular supply chain and how American resources will fit in? Yeah, that's so. I mean, one of the big things is, I mean, obviously, you need the entire aspect, right? You need to produce the products and you need the customers. Um, on the battery side, that's abundant. I mean, they're producing lithium hydroxide or even oxides for that matter coming through our process. There's plenty of battery producers or really cathode producers in, domestically here that we can sell to at any moment, at any, any time we want. Um, the magnet side is being developed. And, and it is game changer because nobody, I mean, without, you can't have just a lithium ion battery and expect to have an electric vehicle. You need the permanent magnet motor um, that is being developed here. And, and ultimately there's very few people that are really truly looking at a solution. I mean, it's, if you're looking at liquid to liquid or solvent based extraction, that's old school technology that China is gonna beat you every single time. If you're gonna go head to head against China, you better do something a little bit differently. Um, you need to be a little bit more innovative. And that's honestly, as an American, I feel comfortable because I think our military is that way, right? We, we focus on high value drones and military systems that, that, that if we just went out there and said, we're going to throw a billion people at it. Well, we don't have a billion people. Um, so you have to innovate and you have to develop real technologies that can really compete on cost structure and efficiency and quality, right? I mean, it's, we've recycled magnets that, that have come from various applications that aren't supposed to have lanthium and cerium in it. And they do. Um, I, we can ensure our customers get high, the highest quality of product because of our technology, but it's also domestically produced, which is absolutely what's needed here. And that's where it's really growing to upstream and downstream. And we're in good conversations all the way on the, on the downstream side of it with many different customers that really want our products because of that quality component. Okay, so beyond these technologies, you've also announced the recent acquisition of ETI. We talked a little bit about that um, in the beginning of the conversation and a strategic part partnership with Heritage Group. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the acquisitions and what kind of value has been unlocked for American resources 
And then also what your overall vision is for these partnerships. Yeah, um, I mean, ETI is, we've known the founder of ETI for many years. I mean, I guess probably over, started knowing him in the coal industry in 2008, um, maybe in 2007. And uh, what he's developed though in that aspect, working on different DOE or DOD funded projects and the technology he's developed there is a huge deal. When you're looking at fly ash or virgin ores or carbon-based feedstocks, then refuse piles, and, and then the, the amount of analysis is done over the last five years to determine the most viable sites is, is huge. And being able to take a site on a parts per million basis without physical separation and, and bringing it to a two to five to 10% concentrate is a huge deal. I mean, that's, that's what is, dip, that's the differentiator of where our industry and this industry is going to struggle in that because rares aren't rare. The concentration of high value concentration of them is, is quite rare. Um, and this is the one piece of technology that, that we really needed to make our carbon based feedstocks, which we have, like I said, over 30,000 acres of, of controlled land already. And, and that's probably going to continue to grow. Um, where we can then monetize that technology and then bring it to electrolysis, to, which really that it's that first mile that we wanted and we finally got to really open up a lot of doors on different fly ash sites, different landfills. I mean, there's billions of tons of fly ash laying around in with pretty high concentrates, but but not economical yet. And uh, this is one of the byproduct that this is, ties in with byproduct economics that'll make it very viable. Um, Mark, I'll let you talk about heritage. Um, yeah, no, and 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 to that point, um, I mean, we're in the mining space. We, we we get it. And when I said earlier that this is an all hands on approach, um, all hands on deck approach. Excuse me. Um, it really is. Uh, we we need to mine mineral uh, domestically and be able to purify it here domestically. We also need to recycle and our our own controlled feedstocks. There is a ton of attention from government on carbon-based sources of, of rare earth elements and critical and rare earth elements because they're present. Now it's challenging because of the concentration. Um, you ideally would want to start with the highest concentration you can. You want to, uh, you know, mid single digit or low double digit um, concentration. Um, unfortunately, we're dealing with parts per million. The, the aspect is how do you make that commercially viable? If you're just going to go mine coal or carbon or tailings for the critical or rare earth elements out of it, that's a tough gig. Uh, good luck to you. Um, but having it applied within when we can, we can produce very high quality carbon for the infrastructure market. Um, create other sources of green energy. And a byproduct of that is essentially your critical and rare earth elements and layering in some of these innovations like the ETI technology to be able to, in real time, at the point of extraction, increase the concentration of it, just creates a greater efficiencies as you continue to, to go down the line to pro further process it and to further purify it. It makes all of those processes that much more efficient. Um, the Heritage Group is... They're, they're a great partner of ours. They come, they're multi-generational, been around for what, 100 years, um, long-standing history and success in um, material science, sustainability, recycling, transportation science. Um, they have, they've incubated several multi-billion dollar public companies. Um, they're from an investor standpoint, I would view it as very smart and patient capital that's come to the table for us. Um, they probably have close, if not over 30 um, operating companies underneath their umbrella. Um, they've had, they, they incubated a company internally, um, Heritage Battery Technology, uh, that more recently uh, merged and acquired uh, Retrieve Technology, still operates under the Retrieve um, name. That, that is the largest battery recycling platform in North America. Um, that's, uh, Heritage is a uh, Indiana-based company as well. Um, private, probably a $9 billion private company, largest employer in our state. Um, but they, come, they came to us, they do a lot of work with Purdue. They know the Purdue technology. Um, they know our, um, our mindset, our entrepreneurial um, 
spirit and aggressiveness to commercialize those technologies, um, and they want to be a part of it. Um, and like I said, they have a great network of um, whether it's auto, whether it's defense, um, other private industry, um, environmental services. They have a great network um, to bring to the table, to help bring to the table for us to synthesize those partnerships further as we continue to expand and execute. So Mark and Mark, congratulations, amazing progress that you guys have accomplished and something really to be proud of, having an impact um, definitely in the US, um, but, but for your shareholders as well. Um, with that in mind, Mark um, Jensen, if you could just let us know, I know we talked about just a, a little slice of everything that it's under the American Resources umbrella today, huge and important slice. I wanted to talk about um, what investors can expect for the remainder of the year for American Re from American resources across the board. Yeah, I mean, so I think Mark and the rest of our team here have always focused on creating sustainable value. I could announce, we could go sign up an OEM today um, and say, hey, we'll sell you all of our lithium. Um, or lithium hydroxide or cobalt or nickel. They'll, any of the, I mean, they're buying it for their battery producers, so they're not actually really selling it to the OEM. Um, we'd rather do it when we're actually producing product. And we'd rather make that announcement when we're actually producing product. To, to us, it's about actually building fundamental value for the long term. Um, no different than ramping up our mining operation. We, we, had a, we had a slow year last year. I mean, we, had, we faced challenges that we didn't expect on the labor markets, and uh, we've fixed that. Uh, we're making money now. And, uh, and that's a key. And, and we have the ability to continue to grow that by bringing additional mines online and, and we're attracting good labor and we have a good team. Uh, we're also low cost. So we're not gonna put ourselves in a position where when the market does come back down or if it does, we're not sustainable. Um, we're also about creating shareholder value. I mean, and then at the end of the day, why? Because we're all shareholders, we're not hired guns. Uh, we created this business with our partners and we've had phenomenal investors. We've had, I mean, one thing we, I, I would say the, the individual retail investor has been some of the strongest parties of ours and some of our biggest shareholders, over 20,000 shareholders. Um, but it's about creating real fundamental value. And no different than our SPAC and Novastare, we think we got some really good things going on there in, in very short order to dividend those shares out um, and, and create that equity event for all of our shareholders. And then we also said, we're looking at exploring how do we unlock the value between American resources and American rare earth. And uh, with some of the strategic partnerships we have in place and some of the strategic partnerships we're working on right now, um, it, probably makes sense to, to further explore that a little bit more um, and, and showcase that. I mean, as, as we did in the last month where we announced we were, we were making money on the mining side, and as we continue to ramp up that cash flow and grow that cash flow each month based on bringing additional sections online and, and taking advantage of better market pricing, we're, we're focused on unlocking that value that will be sustainable. So it's not just saying, hey, we got a contract with some OEM or some car manufacturer that we won't produce anything for the next five years. Let's, let's just produce it and then sell it to them. And I think that's a better announcement. And I think it'll be a fun one. Um, but it's, it's about creating value for the long term for all of our shareholders that are, that are here and actually in it for the fundamental purpose. Wonderful. So Mark and Mark, we have a great audience uh, that's dialed in for today. We are going to turn it over to the live Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, you can type it into the Q&A portion um, at the bottom of your screen and we will get to as many as we can. So let's see what we have here. Okay. Yeah. okay. Hello everyone and thanks for taking my question. This is Heiko from HC Wainwright. So I was thinking, given recent geographical risk factors and the commensurate fear of the M&A environment, I wanted to see if you all might have a newfound appetite from some for some larger scale deals. And on that same note, what are you seeing with the transaction multiples? Obviously, there is a newfound premium in any asset base in the U.S. Thank you. Thanks, Heiko. Uh, I'll take first crack, then I'll let Mark dive in. I mean. We've grown our business through acquisition and organic growth. Um, we're not going to overpay for something. It's, it's and let's talk probably more predominantly on the rare side. I mean, the mining side, we don't really have to buy anybody else. We have so much organic growth that we can expand on um, that 
we could ramp up our properties and bring new mines online. Add, I mean, our Carnegie Two Mine could add twenty to thirty million dollars of revenue to the business um, when we choose to fully bring that mine online. So it's and then bringing additional sections online at Perry, the, the next pillar section we're developing right now. Um, there, there's substantial growth there, and that's and that's solid cash flow. I mean, every new section we bring online brings in new product that we can sell in the current market, and thankfully, each month the current market keeps going up. Um, and so that's not a, not a bad position to be in from a mar margin perspective. On the rare side, we bought ETI. Uh, we announced that acquisition. Um, I think we bought it right. Uh, paid about five times cash flow for it. Um, good business, solid management team want to be with us. We have the ability to, we believe, significantly expand that technology for our own use and, and potentially other uses as well through some of our relationships. Um, we think we're way undervalued based on our peers. I mean, fundamentally, we're we're hitting our stride cash flow wise. We think we're undervalued asset value wise. We think we're undervalued the rare side. I think we're getting almost no value for, and, and that's going to change pretty quickly in our opinion. Um, but we, we want to be careful on, on how we grow the business to maximize shareholder value. I mean, the last deal we did, we think is extremely accretive. We issued shares at 350 a share. Um, it was, a, and then paying a little bit of cash out of cash flow for it, but it's a, it was a great transaction for us. We have a really clean balance sheet. Um, so we're, we're going to be careful about how we grow the business because we don't have to, I mean, we, we got that first mile now and we already have the final stage. And will we look at going downstream? I think so. Um, on the magnet side, motor side, there's some things we're looking at there that, that could make a ton of sense. Um, and that can be more valuable for our shareholders long-term, but then it's also how we structure those deals to be really accretive. And we don't want to have to go back to market. We don't have, we don't have to dilute shareholders and, and we're not going to. Yeah. I mean, the geopolitical environment is always, it's, it's a crazy world out there. I mean, there's a war going on right now and um, what, probably top five rare earth deposits um, in the world. Um, I don't know if that's a coincidence or not, but I think it speaks to um, the importance of what we're doing and um, why we have our head down and highly focused on executing. Um, there's, there's a lot of moving parts. There, there, there's, there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of pieces on the chessboard that are moving around. Um, it, we, what we're focused on is staying within our lane, um, executing on what we can be that value added component of isolation and purification. Um, we can also produce our own feedstocks as a byproduct um, of our, of our controlled resource base and do it economically. Um, and we can be an important component in the domestic supply chain. We're never going to, not, not one entity is going to supply the demand. Um, that demand growth is just way too, way too exponential. Uh, but we'll be, I think, a very important value added component to our domestic supply chain and redefining how these resources are not only sourced, but processed and purified. Um, and I think that's going to, um, that's going to that's going to be successful for for us and all of our shareholders in the long term. Okay, our next question comes from John Hansen. You are a few weeks away from producing rare earth from magnets or batteries. How many dollars per month is your goal for this? Also, where are you getting these batteries and magnets to recycle? Yeah, I mean the the near term nature of our facility is ramping up. We we believe we could produce about 500 kilograms a day. Um, getting it to the tons level per day. Um, this first facility will, will always keep up and running. It's, it's a semi-scale, commercial scale facility. Um, it's not the largest, um, but it's, it, it can get to a point of actually supporting the entire division, which is great. Um, it's pretty low cost division, but the, the overall game plan is to then co-low at other locations and or um, build a, a, a various sites. We have, we have a seven and a half acre site, five miles from there we can build our next facility and our CapEx to build it is, is quite low. Um, and, and that's the beauty of our technology is that it's not that expensive to build a much more scalable facility than this, this production facility is two production trains. Our next production, our next facility would be 12 production trains with, at about 50 to hundred X the size of each production train that we're building now. Um, so, I mean, what's our goal is to showcase the economic viability, the consistency of the product for our customers, and then scale it from there um, in pretty short order. And, and there's plenty of government-based capital out there to, to build that next facility and or build it out of cash flow or, or do debt financing to build the next size of the facility, but it's not going to be dilutive capital, um, partnership capital, not at these, not at these levels. 
Um, but I mean, what's our, our goal is get it up to five to 6 million in revenue in pretty short order and then, then scale it to hundred to 200 million in revenue. Battery space is obviously a lot bigger than magnets. Um, and there's a lot more growth in the lithium ion battery marketplace today. And there's, and, and there's a lot more producers here domestically. Now on the magnet side though, there's some really high value applications that we can get into and, and both in the, on the private enterprise as well as on the government side. To your second part of that question, um, I think John answered, uh, asked that. Um, we're currently getting, so for our, for our two feed stocks, the, the magnets predominantly come from expired wind turbines. Um, it's a great feed stock for us. Uh, each wind turbine has about 126 kilograms of magnet mass, um, about 280 pounds. Um, of that, of those magnets, there's, uh, they're about 30 to 36% um, uh, components of rare earth elements inherent in those. So uh, those are just really, really efficient feedstocks for us. On the, on, on the battery side, we are, uh, we've gotten um, expired um, NMC batteries from, uh, I believe GM, um, I think they're GM, right, Mark? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, we, that we've taken and, and, and purified to a uh, over a 99% yield of all inherent um, elements and over 99.5% purity of all the lithium, cobalt, nickel, manganese, uh, graphite, and carbon black. So, um, And then also the, the black mass we've gotten from our partners and a few other battery recyclers out there that are looking for that final stage isolation and purification. Yeah, but like Mark said, the, the, the battery side is, is easier to source end of life material. Magnets is a little bit smaller of a market, but very, very important as far as uh, technology applications, uh, Department of Defense applications, things like that. So, um, and it can be profitable on its own right. Okay. So we have time, we do have time for a few more questions. So Roger Smithson asked, who do you envision your customers will be on the rare earth side? That's a good question. I mean, I think on the on the rare earth side, I think I would be shocked if one of our customers is not the government. Um, and then also, I mean, there's the magnet producers, um, which is a very short list in the United States today. Um, we are working on that. We're working on the up the, the downstream component of the rare earth side. On the the battery metal side, I mean, that's that's easy. It's going to be it'll be one of the car manufacturers that have one of their battery manufacturers and, and we are, we're in talks with a number of them right now um, that and then the beauty of our product is is that it's battery grade but also there's been a lot of analysis done on recycled materials that being same quality and spec as virgin materials and uh, and that's where you got to get into that 99.99 percent purity on an isolated basis so when they're blending out I mean if you look at a lithium-ion battery only 48 percent of it's lithium and so to create that very precise spec um, you have to be able to produce it that grade and that quality to make sure that when they're blending back in. But that's what, um, on the battery side, it'll definitely be one of the, the car manufacturers or their battery manufacturers for them. Okay. All right, we have a question from Steve Siegel. Thank you for somehow putting all these technologies and patents together so ARAC can become a major company providing rare earth elements. Will ARAC be able to use government funding similar to West Virginia for new facilities that you build out? Yes, we believe so. Um, we've, we're have we working with a partner on that, which is, I mean, the beauty of that, it's non-dilutive capital. Um, we've been involved in two DOE projects on supporting roles and then further roles. Um, we have another one that's going to phase two, which is awesome uh, because of the success of it. But getting access to the loan guarantee program of the DOE is, uh, we've, we've been in talks with them. Um, it's pretty stringent. You got to produce for the light automotive vehicle. Um, it has to be your, your end of light. Um, th we believe we will qualify for that. Um, now, that being said, there's no guarantees. But we, we believe that with our technology and, and showcasing in a commercial environment, hence our facility we're building right now, um, will enable us to qualify for it if we need it. Um, but I mean, I can't, there's no guarantees on anything in, in that front. I wouldn't say there was, but I, I believe based on where we're at, and I think our team believes based on where we're at, that, that we can't qualify and that we provide an essential need to what the program's all about. Yeah. One of the current programs that we're um, highly exploring right now is uh, one of the Department of uh, Energy's eight, under the uh, ATVM, Advanced Technology of Vehicle Manufacturing. I think initially there was about 17, million, 17 billion 
dollars in that program. Um, predominantly, all of that has been tapped by uh, major uh, downstream OEM, uh, auto OEMs, um, Tesla, General Motors uh, of such. Um, we, we've we've had discussions. We made some commentary as far as being able to uh, work upstream because the the supply chain is just in its infancy stage. But I mean, th these are great programs because you're you're, you're borrowing at uh, essentially treasury rates. But because of that, I mean, the government doesn't. They do have a, a relative uh, risk profile. They don't want to take on high risk, and it's exactly why we pivoted and and we're and we're doing the facility that we're doing to showcase two production trains and the commercial viability of both those production trains to be able to um, put a good foot forward when we're talking to these, these entities and these programs that, uh, that have funding available. Okay, Paul Sons wants to know, how long is your exclusive for the rare earth technology? Yeah, um, we own, well, with ETI, we own, I think we own or control over 19 different patents and technologies today. Um, and they're all in various stages of when they were patented, but most of them have been within the last five years. Um, one of them is just filed as a provisional patent that, uh, that we have access to is uh, just filed a few months ago. Um, and so it's, I mean, in terms of the life of the patents, we're, they're all relatively new patents. Tim Tesh would like to know um, regarding Australia and rare earth, what about licensing patents? Australia has many investors, including the government, but the big charge is to do it clean. They seem stuck. Can producers license your patents? There is no doubt once we showcase chromatography for rare earth elements and battery metals that it's gonna be the worldwide solution. Um, I, I genuinely, truly, I bet all my money on it because I'm a shareholder and that's where all my money's at. Um, so that's that's one way to speak about it. Um, the the, the I, I, yeah, I mean, would we explore unlocking that value on a worldwide basis for sure? Um, in some form of structure, we're actually in talks with. Um, we've had some really good conversations over in South Africa, uh, which has been dominated by the Chinese. Um, we have some friends over there that do business that have showcased uh, showcased shown us some of their their feedstocks that they already have and. Uh, and I mean, is including the ETI technology, right? Um, so there's there's definitely some doors that we can open there. We may not license, we may license. Um, we haven't necessarily formulated that structure yet of how we're gonna do it, but maybe joint ventures and it may just be expansion. And really what the key is though, is getting access to those feeds coming into the United States market. And that's what the government-based programs want. That's what the domestic market needs. I mean, I have two brothers in the military, genuinely care about the safety of my country and North America in general. Um, and so if we can get access to those concentrates coming back to the United States, we'd probably be even more inclined to do it. Now, obviously we have to do what's in the best interest of our shareholders. So if the deal's right, we'll, we'll entertain it, um, as long as our, we're protected under it and we have worldwide patent rights. So I, there's definitely some ways to explore that. And we're already starting some conversations on that front. Perfect. Thank you. So that does include the amount of time that we have for the Q&A. Um, Mark Jensen, any parting words before we close out? I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're pretty excited about where we're at. We have some really close milestones that are being achieved, um, including the first processing facility that will be up and running here in the next few months, definitely within the first half of this year, maybe sooner, um, maybe sooner as in the next month or so. Um, but uh, and really, what we have a uniquely structured business. We have a business that's been built because at the end of the day, we're also shareholders and we want to unlock value between the various equity programs and, and programs we have in place, such as the SPAC, such as Novastera, about unlocking those values. I mean, the, I think there was just an announcement that Tesla is evaluating graphene. Um, we think Novastera could do extremely well with that, um, with the development of the, the patents that, that we license to them. And we own half that company and we'll dividend those out to our shareholders. Um, and over time and maybe sooner than later. Um, so it's uh, at the end, really what we care about is, is building that sustainable business that will drive shareholder value. We're putting our money where our mouth is. A uh, number of management teams buying stock on our 10B5 plans continue to do so. Um, based on our peers, we think we have a lot of room for success as we continue to showcase our execution. And uh, we, we started to do that in the last few months on the mining side. And we're gonna be doing that very quickly here on the rare side. But 
the value that we have on that rare earth and battery metals with the technology that we have and the technology team, I'm going to give props to Texas Tech, to Ohio, um, the patents that, that were developed there, uh, Penn State, um, Mohamed Rezi, who's phenomenal. Um, and then the Purdue team, Dr. Wang, uh, Yi Ding, Gabriel, and the rest of the team there. I mean, they're awesome. They're about as talented as you get. And those partnerships are enabling us to unlock this value in a pretty low cost format um, and, and do it on in a very uh, capital light way of really bringing these technologies to light and on a commercial basis. And, and we're getting ready in the next few months to showcase a lot of that. And, and in, at the end of the day, we think that we have a lot of room for success for our shareholders and, and want to continue to build a business that we feel proud of in a sustainable way. Excellent way to end it. We're so grateful for you joining the platform so we can spotlight such an important topic. Um, Mark Jensen, Marco Avogada, American Resources, thank you so much for your participation today. And thank you to our audience. Great, great questions, huge participation. Glad to see the interest for this exciting company. As a reminder, American Resources trades on NASDAQ under the ticker AREC. So happy to have everyone join us today. Um, this does conclude our spotlight series for the day. For replays of all of our events for the day, you can visit www.virtualinvestorco.com. Thank you everyone for joining and thank you, Mark and Mark.